let me begin this morning by sharing a story from the not too distant past about an interesting event in American history. Historians name Thomas Jefferson as the most influential of our founding fathers. For without him, it is likely that the nation would have never been birthed. He helped author the Declaration of Independence. He founded the University of Virginia. He oversaw the Louisiana Purchase. He established the United States Military Academy, and he helped abolish the slave trade in 1807. But in 1820, six years before he passed away, President Thomas Jefferson undertook maybe his most memorable and controversial act. He set out to create his own version of the New Testament. And here was his reasoning. He said Jesus was a great teacher, and in fact, Jesus was a great philosopher, and in fact, Jesus even had great insights on morality, but his miracles are just too ridiculous to believe. And so Thomas Jefferson, using a razor and scissors, physically cut out the miracles, cut out the resurrection, cut out the ascension, and cut out all other supernatural events that were recorded. And wouldn't you know it, he ended up with a New Testament that was only 84 pages long. And he named the book The Philosophy, Life, and Morals of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is an actual picture of the Bible that he edited. Thinking about that story today, the question comes to my mind, how many of us in like manner are reading a Bible that we have conveniently edited in our own minds to skip out on the stuff that we find hard to believe? See, friend, either the Bible will change you or you will change it. Either the Word of God will cut you or you will cut it. Either God will be true and every man a liar, or man will be true and God will be found a liar. But can I tell you this this morning? I've been inspired by a lot of books, but only transformed by one. I've been educated by a lot of texts, but my mind has only ever been renewed by one. And I'm not sure where you are with God this morning, but my Bible is still filled with miracles. It is still filled with signs and wonders. It is still filled with the unexpected unexplainable and wonderful works of a sovereign God who still heals the sick, still cleanses the lepers, still casts out demons, and still raises from the dead. It is not just history. It is not just narrative. It is not just a good story. It is not just personal reflections. It is a living document that testifies of a living God. Hallelujah. I'm not reducing God to somehow fit within the intellectual framework of Western culture. I am not skipping out on miracles because they take too much faith to believe. No, we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. We're not changing scripture. We're changing culture. We're not downgrading the word of God. We're upgrading our minds. And if our experience doesn't matter, what the scripture says we aren't changing scripture we're changing us amen, amen. see Jesus wasn't just a good leader he wasn't just a, a moral teacher he wasn't just one of many influential first century philosophers he was a son of the living God who was raised from the dead by God's own spirit and still everything hinges on him today and by the way the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead now dwells in you and gives you strength and gives you power in your physical body can you give God a mighty hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. I want to m m preach this morning on the subject unlimited power. Because we serve a God who has supplied unlimited power to you as a child of God. Because of the cross and because that price has been paid, not only can the spirit of God come upon you, the spirit of God now dwells inside of you. And the Spirit of God isn't there just to make you worship. 
The Spirit of God isn't there just to give you goosebumps. The Spirit of God isn't there just to make you happy. The Spirit of God is there to equip you with unlimited power to be an effective witness for Him. The Spirit of God is there so that you might be effective in the kingdom of God. And there is an unlimited supply of power that is available to you as a child of God. And I think that too often we in the church, we we limit God on what He can do. And we limit God to just the the book of Acts, but not the God of today. But we are a church that believes that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did back then, he's still doing it today. And when we come to Christ, we ought to accept Christ in totality, not in partiality. You see, sometimes people come to God and they say, well, I believe him as my savior, but I don't believe him as my healer. I believe that he's my savior, but I don't know about the whole baptism with the Holy Spirit and speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave the utterance. Can I tell you here this morning, He's not just a Savior, He's a healer. He's not just a healer, He's a deliverer. He's not just a deliverer, He's a baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He's not just the first coming King, Jesus is the second coming King. I believe that Jesus is coming back for His church. And He's coming back for a church without spot, without wrinkle, that's been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. John the Baptist, he said, I indeed baptize you with water, but there is coming one who's mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not even worthy to untie. And he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, one of the reasons why that's important is because you see the distinction between water baptism and the baptism with the Holy Spirit. You know, some people think that When you get water baptized, that at that moment you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. The baptism with the Holy Spirit is completely separate from water baptism. Water baptism is an outward expression to the world of an inward change. It's an outward symbol to everybody else that your life has been changed through the gospel. But the baptism with the Holy Spirit is when Jesus is Jesus immerses you in the Spirit of God that you might be an effective witness for him. And when you study out the word of God, you really, you discover that there are three different baptisms that are alluded to. First, you have baptism into Christ, and then you have water baptism, and then you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The moment you believed on Jesus, no matter where you were, you might have been in in a bar room, you might have been strung out on the couch, high on drugs. And the moment you believed on Jesus, at that moment, you were baptized into Jesus. You were placed in Jesus. You were baptized into his death, his burial, and resurrection. Which means that 2,000 years ago when Jesus was crucified on that cross, he was not crucified alone. The old man, the old woman that you used to be was crucified with him. The drug addict, the alcoholic was crucified with him. And, you know, that's why we have an issue with programs that will tell you that for all of your life, you're always going to be a recovering alcoholic. Or that for all of your life, you're always going to be a a recovering drug addict. And it's almost like a a stamp. It's like a a salvage title that they put on you that says you're never going to be the same. But we serve a God that makes all things new. And we believe that the drug addict is no more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I remember when I was in college, I was working at an upscale Italian restaurant down in Louisiana. And somebody asked me if I had a lighter. And... I said, no. I said, I don't smoke anymore. And he said, well, what happened? AA, speaking of Alcoholics Anonymous. I said, no, BA. He said, what's BA? I said, born again. Hallelujah. (laughs) You see, when you get born again by simple faith, he begins to take out the desires. He begins to change your heart. He begins to replace those desires with his desires. That's why we're not trying to change you. We want you to come in a relationship with Jesus, and Jesus is the one that changes you from the inside out. Hallelujah. You can try to put a bunch of rules and regulations on the people of God, but can I tell you something? Rules without relationship breeds rebellion. And it comes through a personal relationship with Jesus that you actually want to live for God. And all of a sudden, the things that you used to do, God just begins to take away the desire. And let me say this here this morning. The greatest thing that can happen to a sinner is they get saved. But the greatest thing that can happen to the believer is they get baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. 
Because the Spirit of God is there to make Jesus more real in your life. The Spirit of God is there to make Jesus more real as your Savior, more real as your healer, more real as your deliverer, more real as a baptizer in the Holy Spirit. And the moment you got saved, the Holy Spirit came to indwell inside of your heart. But there is a second work of grace, and that is the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And we believe according to Scripture, this isn't uh, our opinion, this is a uh, d- denomination, even though we're not part of a denomination. This is the Word of God. We believe that everybody who is baptized in the Holy Spirit, that they will speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives utterance. And you know, there's a lot of people, they grow up in Pentecostal churches, and you know, they have never heard a message on the baptism with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. I went to one of the largest Pentecostal churches in this country before moving to Louisiana uh, for college, but it was about 10,000 members, and I'm very thankful for what God did in my life through that church and how God used it, but I don't remember ever hearing a message on the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, so many people, they, they, you know, they fear what they don't understand, and, and, and so they walk into churches, and if they don't understand and they don't, they don't uh, know what the Scripture has to say about speaking in tongues, sometimes it can, it can confuse them. Or, you know, sometimes people think that, you know, they're less of a Christian. Can I just say this here this morning? There's no such thing as first or second class Christians in the kingdom of God. Amen. The moment you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you're a brother, you're a sister in Christ. You're born again. You're a child of God. The Holy Spirit is indwelling inside of you. But we believe that it's God's will for all born-again believers to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. And you see many expressions throughout Scripture that are really synonymous with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, Luke 24 and 49, it says that they were endued with power from on high, which means to be clothed with power from on high. You'll see in Scripture the Holy Spirit came upon them or the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Those are all examples of the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. I want to take you to Ezekiel chapter 47. Ezekiel chapter 47 and verse 3, it says, And when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits. And he brought me through the waters. The waters there are a type of the Holy Spirit. He brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my ankles. And he measured 1,000 cubits. And brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my knees. And he measured 1,000 and brought me through, and the water came up to my waist. Then verse 5, it says, again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that, could not cro- that I could not cross. For the water was too deep, water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. Can I tell you something here this morning? There is always more for you. There is always more of the presence of God. There's always more of the the Spirit of God. I I, I think it's easy in church world to get complacent with the mediocre. And you just kind of get content. But God said, I want you to either be hot or I want you to be cold. There's no in between. And I believe that God is looking for a church that is on fire for him, a a body of believers that are full of the Spirit of God, that are full. I'm so thankful that I came in contact with in contact with churches that believe in the power of God, that, that believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, that seek the face of God. I, I grew up in a lot of churches where that wasn't the case, and I don't speak disparagingly of them because oftentimes it's all that they know, but all they do is just go through the motions. You start talking about the Holy Spirit, that's where they get a little uncomfortable. I had another pastor tell me, he said, he said I, we believe in the Holy Spirit, but we just don't know what to do with it. Well, can I tell you, number one, the Holy Spirit isn't an it. The Holy Spirit is a he. He is a person. But a lot of people are in that place. They, they just don't know what to do with the moving and the operation of the Holy Spirit because they're so used to being in control of everything. And when the Holy Spirit has his way, then he takes control of the services and he takes control of the worship and he takes control of the preacher. Half of what I'm preaching here this morning, I didn't plan to preach on this morning, but I feel the presence of God and sense the unction of the Holy Spirit to preach it to you here this morning. Amen. 
The Spirit of God, he'll lead you and he will guide you. One of the purposes of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is for power. It's an, an unction. It's whenever uh, more there's more latitude for the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, which result in a greater unction, a greater anointing, a greater insight to the Word of God, a greater passion and worship and prayer, a greater impact for the kingdom of God. Now, I am not one of those that will say that if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit that God cannot use you at all. I don't believe that's right. You look at men like Billy Graham who never professed to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And yet God used him to reach millions of souls and bring in millions of souls to the kingdom of God. And let me go as far as saying this. I've got to be careful here. Help me, Holy Spirit. Sometimes we'll write off churches that don't have a full understanding of sanctification. They don't understand the cross for sanctification, so we just write them off. And I was listening to MOTC program this last week, and they had to address this very thing. And somebody brought up to Brother Swagger the millions of people that came to Christ when he didn't understand the cross for sanctification. And yet God was still using them all around the globe to see millions of souls come in for the glory of God. I say that to say this, that we got to be careful who we write off and we got to be careful who we, 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 we ex out of the church because I believe that God is bigger than a lot of boxes that we put him in. And if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit and, and you don't speak with tongues and all we're saying is that you ought to get in the word of God and ask God concerning this thing because it's real and we believe it's for the church today, and it will help you be a more effective witness for Jesus. The, the meaning of baptism is a full immersion. It's like the idea of a, a sunken ship, a ship that's fully immersed. When you get saved, you're in the water, but we believe that God wants to fully immerse you with the Spirit of God. It's like a, a sponge that cannot soak up any more water. I used to tell my friends after I got saved, I used to say, I want to take God to the next level. What I didn't understand is that God wanted to take me to the next level. And that next level was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I lost some Baptist friends as a result, but that's okay. I still love them. I hope they still love me. I grew up in a lot of Baptist churches, and many teach that the baptism of the Holy Spirit and tongues and interpretation and prophecy, they believe that those ceased either at the conclusion or the completion of the canon of Scripture or when the early apostles passed away. But can I tell you, it's still for the church today. I've seen too much for man to tell me it ain't real. I've seen too many people baptized in the Holy Spirit for men to say it's no longer for today. Let God be true and every man a liar. You can't cut out parts of the Bible that are hard for you to believe. You've got to accept Jesus for who he is. You've got to consume the whole lamb. In the Old Testament, they were required to consume the entirety of the lamb. You can't just take parts and pieces of Jesus. You've got to take him at his word. Hallelujah. You know, some of the purposes in speaking in tongues, I, I believe that God has given us this gift and that he has given us this language to use, that he, he added it to the new covenant for a purpose, not just for an insignificant side part. Because I think that's another thing you see in the church where people are like, well, if God really wants me to speak in tongues, he'll make me speak in tongues. God will never force you to speak in tongues. The, the Holy Spirit is symbolized as a dove. He's a gentleman. He'll never override your free will. You got to, the Bible says if earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to the, their children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? The question is, is have you asked God for the baptism with the Holy Spirit? And so we believe that tongues has, a, has powerful benefits to your spiritual life when used consistently. And if we neglect speaking in tongues in our prayer life, we will miss out on, a, on an entire realm of prayer that God has for the believer. You see, when you pray in tongues, it, it stimulates faith and it helps us learn how to trust God more, to, more, more fully. When you pray in tongues, it allows you to speak directly to God. It keeps you in tune with the Spirit of God. It strengthens your spirit. It allows you to pray even when you don't know what to pray. The Bible says sometimes we don't even know what to pray. Sometimes we're just speechless and we ought to just start praying in tongues, start praying in the Holy Spirit and let the Spirit of God pray through you hallelujah you see the spirit of god he searches deep within your hearts 
You know, a lot of people are going crazy recently over the, the Chinese spy balloon flying over our country. Who cares? I like that. <laughs> We're afraid the Chinese are, are looking into us or seeing what's going on when you got all these satellites out in space and they say it's not any different than any of that. You know, the Spirit of God, we got spiritual satellites in our life. You like that? I don't know where that came from. Thank you, Holy Ghost. We got spiritual satellites in our life. The Spirit of God sees deep within your heart. He sees things that you don't even see. He knows about things that we don't even know about. And so when you start praying in tongues, the Spirit of God is taking those things, taking those requests, taking that heartache, taking that pain, and bringing it, bringing it before the Father. If you don't know what to pray, you don't have to just start praying in that heavenly prayer language and let the Spirit of God pray through you. Hallelujah. He's giving it to you for a purpose. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. It's a, it's a weapon against the work of the enemy. I, I, you know, I've been on the mission field in nations around this world. I have seen no, no doubt, uh, it, without a doubt, demon possession. And, you know, there were times where I didn't know what to do, but just start praying in tongues. Amen. Praying in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I would see at times where they would just freeze up and they wouldn't know what to do. It's because greater is he that is in you than he who is in this world. And if you don't know what to pray, I, I, I preached in New Orleans before. I've gone down French Quarter. I remember one time there was a line of psychics, like six of them lined up along the French Quarter. And I was with some pastor uh, friends, and if God be for us, who can be against us? So, you know, I just started going one at a time, started preaching at them. First one just kind of ignored me. And then as I went on, it started getting more and more intense. When I got to that last one, they just got up in a rage and jumped out from behind the table. I just lifted my hands and started speaking in tongues. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. So the Holy Spirit, when you pray in tongues, it's a weapon against the work of the enemy. You also see in Isaiah chapter 28, verses 11 and 12, it says, For stammering lips in another, in another tongue he will speak to this people, to whom he said, This is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. And when you pray in the Holy Spirit, it will bring rest and it will bring refreshment to your soul. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. You don't got to be in church to speak in tongues. You can be playing basketball, playing football, driving down the highway on your recliner. Three o'clock in the morning, get out of your bed and just start praying in tongues. Hallelujah. The, the moments that shaped my walk with God the greatest was probably during college when we would have prayer meetings in the dorms pretty much every night, it seemed like. Sometimes two, three times a day. And you might seem say, well, that sounds kind of crazy. Y'all are a little, y'all are fanatics. But, you know, we were just so hungry for the presence of God. And, you know, you would just get random text, hey, we're having a prayer meeting at so-and-so's dorm room tonight, or maybe down the hallway of the dorms, whatever the case, and we would just seek the face of God. Amen. And those moments in prayer just shaped my walk with God so much. You know, I believe that when it comes to ministry that we've got to get the mind of God, and we've got to seek the face of God right. regarding what he wants us to preach, Amen. every message we preach. The Spirit of God is there to lead you and guide you in all, tr all truth. And the Spirit of God is there for personal edification. Somebody once told me in Springfield, Missouri, but it was a Baptist friend's mother. <laughs> when I was talking to her about speaking in tongues, I said, you know, one of the purposes of speaking in tongues is to edify ourselves. And she said, well, that's kind of selfish, don't you think, to build yourself up? Maybe to the carnal mind but not to the spiritual mind because we grow weary and we get weak and we need personal edification. You know, I think in ministry, we got to be mindful. Yes, God has called you in ministry to edify the church, but you got to be edified yourself because you cannot give what you do not have. And in order to pour oil into others, you must get a fresh refilling of that oil in your own lamp. Your own lamp has to be filled with oil. Your own furnace has to be burning with fire. Before you can give, you must first receive from the Lord. And so when you get filled in the Holy Spirit, it's there for for personal edification, and secondly, it's for the edification of the church. 
And when it's for the edification of the church, it's followed with an interpretation. And that's where a lot of people don't understand the distinction between tongues for personal edification and the gift of tongues for the edification of the body. And we believe in both. We believe that both are for the church today. You know, in the book of Numbers, I won't hold you too much longer this morning just until I get finished. Amen? Amen. Can I have 10 more minutes here? Raise your hand if i got 10 more minutes. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Okay, i got another hour. Thank you. <laughs> but when Moses was leading the people of God through the wilderness, and they were murmuring and they, they were complaining, I mean, when they were seeing victory, praise God, Moses is a man of God. He's hearing from God. And then when they went through the difficult times, then they would get angry and upset with Moses, and they would complain with Moses, and it just got overwhelming for Moses, and so God had him appoint 70 elders, and then the people started complaining about the elders, and then Moses said, I wish that all of your people were prophets and that the Spirit of God was upon them all. Now, Moses might not have known it back then, but that was in an, an anticipation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, the prophet Joel said, In the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. The old men shall dream dreams, and that the young men shall see visions. And then in Acts chapter 1, in verse 8, Jesus commanded them that they should not tarry from Jerusalem until they receive power from on high. He said, You shall receive power. Then when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you shall be witnesses to me. And in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end and to the uttermost parts of the earth or the end of the earth and then you move to Acts chapter 2 and it says when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all in one place in one accord and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting and cloven tongues like as a fire sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Let me say this here this morning. This isn't a, a Pentecostal thing. This isn't an Assemblies of God or Church of God or Foursquare thing. It's a Bible thing, and it's still for you. It's still for the church today. Can you give God a shout of praise in this place this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. So who is a candidate to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Any born-again child of God can receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No matter how long you've been saved, how old you are, male or female, you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, do you have to speak in tongues to be saved? No, you do not. The thief on the cross never spoke in tongues, was never water baptized, but Jesus said, today you shall be with me in paradise. But we believe it is God's will and it is of utmost importance for you as a child of God, not only to be water baptized, but for you to also be filled with the Holy Spirit. Some will say, well, it no longer exists today. It ended back with the early apostles. Well, I've got news for you here today. There are around 300 million Pentecostals around the world. 300 million Pentecostals around the world. According to research, at least one-third of those say that they speak in tongues themselves at least weekly, if not more. And 51% of them say that they attend services that include people speaking in tongues, prophesying, or manifesting other signs of the Spirit of God. We believe it's still for today. We believe it's still for the church today. God used a great man like William Seymour. He was a one-eyed black man who overcame the racial bias of his day, but he believed believed God for the mighty power of the Holy Spirit and was used to spark the great Azusa Street Revival in the early 1900s that led to hundreds of millions of believers getting baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. Man has come too late to tell me it ain't for the church today. Man came too late to tell me it's not for me. Man came too late to tell me that Jesus no longer baptizes in the Holy Spirit. It is for you and it is still for the church today hallelujah. hallelujah don't let anybody rob you out of that blessing out of that gift of the spirit of god one of the best things that you can say is show me scripture for that 
That will solve 99.9% of arguments out there. Do you got scripture for that? Sometimes they do. They just take it out of context. Paul, he asked the question, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? In Acts chapter 19, it says, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus and finding some disciples. And you notice that. So these were people that were always already following Jesus. There's some of you listening here today. You're already, are already a disciple. You're already following Jesus. You've already accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But the Bible says that when Paul, he found these disciples, he said in verse 2, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Or have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And so here you see that it doesn't automatically happen right when you get saved. You can be saved and born again and not yet be filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't make you less of a Christian, but we want you to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? So they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Think about that. How how many people in Pentecostal churches could say the same thing? Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? We haven't even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. I've, I've had people in Pentecostal churches tell me they have never heard anything about speaking in tongues, and it was the first time they ever heard it. They said, uh, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, and to what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism, speaking of water. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized you with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people, that they should believe on him whom they have come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues, and they prophesied. You can stand to your feet here this morning. Singers and musicians can come back. In a moment, we're going to open up the front for really two different purposes. Number one, we want to open it up for those who have never received the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Maybe this is the first time you've ever even heard a message on speaking in tongues. You know what my prayer was when I hadn't been filled? I said, God, if it's from you, I want it. If it's in the Bible, I need it. I want everything that you have for me. In a moment, we're going to invite people up who need to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But we're also going to invite those of you who have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, but you've grown dry and you've grown thirsty. And you would say, I need a refilling of the Spirit of God. I need a fresh touch of the Spirit of God. Can I tell you something here this morning? I have seen literally without exaggeration thousands upon thousands of people baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with tongues, both here in this nation and nations around the world. It's still for today. It's still for the church today. It's for the young. It's for the old. I've seen five-year-olds get baptized in the Holy Spirit. I've seen the elderly get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen. One particular friend of mine during college, he, he has a doctorate's degree in music from Brazil, very analytical And I remember we would pray for him to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he wouldn't get filled. And sometimes it was a little discouraging when we're all laying hands on him and all praying for him. And, you know, sometimes people try to overanalyze things. And the gift of the Holy Spirit is received by faith. And I remember we would pray for him for years. He's about 50 years old. Pray for him for about years. and, And, you know, sometimes you're like, well, maybe they're doing something wrong. But other times, and sometimes that is the case, but other times the Bible says that God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek after him. Sometimes he wants you to ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, knock and keep on knocking. I remember one particular invitation for prayer at one of the services. His name's Francisco. He was there at the front row, hands lifted to God, got baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking with other tongues. I remember hearing people yell, it's real, it's real, it's real, it's real, it's real. Can I tell you something here this morning? It's real, it's real, it's real, it's real, it's real, it's real. And it's for you today as a child of God. Hallelujah. 